Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's featured webinar on analytical validation and performance verification, key components for IVDR compliance. I'm Bill Anleiker from Thermo Fisher Scientific, and I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Rafael Ramirez. Rafael is the Global Business Development Manager at Thermo Fisher Scientific for Professional Services. In this role, Raphael works with users in regulated laboratories and identifies ways to enable those users to comply with their regulatory requirements. Throughout his career, he has specialized in qualification and validation services, particularly computer system validation and analytical validation consulting services. He has assisted pharma, biopharma, and clinical laboratories across the globe to meet their compliance needs. Please join me in welcoming Raphael. Great. Thank you, Bill. Um, so we'll be discussing um, analytical validation. We'll uh, briefly touch also on uh, performance verifications. Um, but of course, we are looking at um, the IBDR uh, regulation uh, in the European Union. So that'll be kind of the framework. But we'll see, be referencing some standards um, from other regions, um, and we'll see how those play. I think that's important to set up as a as a background. So a little bit of, of the agenda. We'll go through an introduction on um, analytical validation, uh, do a little bit of background as well, um, the challenges to complete analytical validation. So we'll type uh, deep dive on on this um, uh, what it takes to do uh, analytical validation. Um, talk about Key personnel. Uh, it's important as laboratories plan to set up for this, um, it's important that they have the right personnel um, in place. Um, and then ultimately, uh, from our perspective, how we help customers with the um, analytical validation the services that, that we offer. So let's look at the um, analytical validations. Um, it is a process. It is uh, globally found within quality standards. And uh, in the European Union specifically, the IVDR sets the regulation that clinical laboratories uh, must follow in order to offer certain regulated services. Um, the IVDR then points to um, certain ISO, um, more specifically the ISO 1345 from the International Standards Organization and the ISO uh, 15189, which is the quality standard for testing within um, clinical laboratories. These standards in turn require laboratories to ensure their testing are validated, right? So first we have the regulation that needs to have, uh, that says that laboratories must comply with certain quality standards. Um, then these quality standards in turn have more, a little bit more specifically uh, called that um, any services need to be uh, validated. In the case of commercially available tests, uh, those will be registered by the manufacturer with the notified bodies. Um, and uh, to do this, the manufacturers themselves need to comply with the same um, standards, the ISO 1345 and the ISO um, 15189. Um, so the, the laboratories that, um, independent laboratories that wish to um, do um, in-house developed tests and, and offer this uh, for, um, as one of their services, they need to comply with the same level of, of requirements. So what we have done is look at um, various international standards and then found, we actually found um, some, a number of similarities between this. Um, CLSSI, the Clinical Laboratory Standard um, uh, Institute, defines the validation as a uh, provision of objective evidence through a defined process that a test performs as uh, intended. The International Standards Organization, ISO, defines validation as a process of confirmation using objective evidence to confirm that requirements within uh, which define a specific intended use or application have fulfilled, have been fulfilled. So we see they're using different language, um, but ultimately they are pretty much giving the same um, expectations of getting objective evidence and looking towards the intended use. Um, of that particular test. Uh, so different countries and nations uh, through legislation set the uh, regulations uh, for clinical testing. Um, in the uh, European Union, we have the uh, IVDR, the IVD regulation. 
um, in the United States. Then we have um, the clinical laboratory improvement amendments, um, known as CLIA. UK has UKCA, um, China has their own. So again, different nations, different uh, countries will have um, these um, regulations at, at a legislative level. Um, so verification, a little bit different, um, but it's still globally recognized. Uh, now in this case, um, the process, and we'll use the definition from the NISD, is um, the provision of objective evidence that a given um, item fulfills specified requirements. Now, we're not looking towards um, intended use in this case, that we're still collecting objective evidence, uh, but now we're looking at requirements that have been set for the implementation of um, that particular um, assay in this case as, as clinical test. So let's uh, talk about a little bit more in detail now on, on analytical validation. So what is an analytical validation? And um, there are two critical aspects uh, during an analytical validation. One of them is the documentation, and the second is um, the collection of uh, tangible evidence. So we immediately see how this ties back to those um, standards set by um, those international organizations. The, the documentation, setting up validation plan, setting up um, uh, reports on, on the uh, uh, objective evidence that has been collected, um, tangible evidence, uh, of course, we need to um, look at the data, uh, analyze that data, report on that data, that goes back to documentation. Um, but it also has to be uh, developed in a way that, that fits the, uh, the intended use, right? So what's the criteria of what we want to do uh, with this um, analytical validation? Um, so when is it necessary? The analytical validation is um, mostly evident, uh, evidently necessary uh, before adding a new test to a clinical menu. Um, laboratories must be conscious of, uh, after they have a, a set um, assay, um, there can be changes, right? So uh, they can have different chemistry, they can have new instrumentation, they can add targets uh, to, their, uh, to their panels. So uh, those different um, uh, variations or, or, or deviations from the original um, validated assay, they need to be assessed and they need to be evaluated. Um, could require full revalidation, uh, could require just doing a study and, and document um, the different uh, process and the results, um, compare those results. Um, but ultimately the important part is that there has to be that uh, revalidation. So um, as we said, let's look at a little bit of, of the background, um, other areas that have um, uh, legislation and have um, quality standards and they have guidelines in place. Um, so we will use this as a reference when, when we uh, discuss a little bit further on, on IVDR. So we look in this case at the United States. They have um, clinical laboratory improvement amendments, um, CLIA was established in 1988 um, by the US Congress. And the CLIA then became the regulation by which clinical laboratories comply um, in order to offer clinical services. Um, the College of American Pathologists, known as SCAP, um, they set out to develop the guidelines that uh, allow laboratories to meet then the CLIA uh, requirements. So together they're formally known as CAP-CLIA, um, but um, they're even, others within the United States, uh, very well known. Um, New York State Department of Health, um, they have their own guidelines uh, for uh, clinical laboratories. In this case, um, they're enforced by the uh, New York State Department of Health. Um, they're considered to be more stringent um, than CAPCLIA, uh, but we'll see once we, we actually break them down, um, there are still similarities between this. Um, so even regionally, we see a little bit of variations on uh, what laboratories need to do to be in compliance and offer clinical services in a particular um, area. So um, in, in, in the case of um, uh, NGS, um, somatic panels, um, NGS is actually, I'm sorry, um, New York State is actually well known because they have uh, very specific uh, requirements in this case. So that's, that's simply a good point to, um, to look at it uh, a little bit more detail. So besides 
the, the clinical requirements uh, for, for laboratory, or the requirements for clinical laboratories um, as, a, as a national requirement, uh, medical devices in the United States, they must comply with the 510K um, regulation or submit under 510K um, by the FDA and then get approval uh, to be uh, commercial available uh, products. So different um, areas, but again, very similar when we look at uh, what other regions do compared to, to the IVDR. So uh, as, as I mentioned, let's break down a little bit more this um, guidelines and, and regulations set out by CLIA, uh, guidelines by CAP, and, and again, um, regulations from the, um, from the New York State. Um, in this case, uh, CLIA, for example, they include accuracy, precision, analytical sensitivity, analytical uh, specificity, a few others. Um, but these are the assay performance characteristics um, that they have established that uh, need to be um, evaluated, need to be reported, um, and that will be part of that um, uh, analytical validation of an, of an assay. Um, some of these guidelines, um, uh, again, New York State, a little bit more specific, they actually give a um, number of samples that need to be run. Uh, CLIA does the same. Um, but again, uh, the, the performance characteristics, um, as you see on, just on the slide, um, they're very similar among all of this. So um, that really helped us to start seeing, we can, we can uh, build some general uh, approach uh, to an article validation and really leverage um, those similarities to be able to service across regions and across um, different areas uh, to, to, again, be able to offer um, an article uh, validation service. So within professional, Thermo Fisher professional services, um, uh, we have used this and to develop a, a very robust uh, validation consulting service um, that they can easily be adapted to different regions and even locally uh, to different um, requirements. Now, um, back to um, IVDR and, and um, the requirements within the, the European Union. Um, as we mentioned before, they point to uh, ISO 15189 as a quality guideline for um, clinical laboratory um, analytical validations. Um, now, in this case, it's not as specific as maybe some others that, that, that we discussed uh, previously. Um, but in this particular case, then we can look at how do we, uh, what performance characteristics, performance parameters um, are set out in other uh, validation guidelines. And then we can see those um, and see the, those fits within what um, ISO 15189 uh, requires. So we can leverage from other international guidelines, uh, look at those um, similarities, um, and then recommend parameters. Um, so in this case, we, we recommend accuracy, reproducibility, repeatability, uh, control known relevant interference, um, analytical sensitivity, analytical specificity, and um, LOD or limit of detection. Um, so um, those will be very robust um, to then fulfill the requirements under um, ISO 15189. Um, so what other um, uh, uh, to keep in mind is um, the performance verification, right? So um, assays are already validated, um, either as, as in-house um, test, a developed test, um, or commercial available uh, products. Um, the laboratories must show um, that they can perform um, and, and meet the uh, parameters um, and the specifications for those particular assays. So performance certification is always um, necessary before doing actual um, testing. So let's move on now into um, the actual AV experience, the, the analytical validation and, and what it takes to, uh, to complete an, an analytical validation. And it can be an overwhelming process, um, uh, not, not only for inexperienced um, laboratories, I guess um, uh, more clearly for an inexperienced laboratory, um, they will have a bigger challenge at completing an analytical validation. Um, but even larger laboratories, experienced laboratories, uh, when they have competing responsibilities, competing projects going on, um, it can be uh, overwhelming and, and it can just delay um, the process. So um, 
key areas that uh, we have identified are critical to be successful with analytical validation. Uh, one of them is the, the pre-validation -pre planning. Um, that analysis um, is also another uh, time-consuming aspect of the validation. And, and ultimately, by a, a robust bioinformatics uh, report. So as, as we discussed early on, um, documentation is very critical, tangible evidence. So in order to have good tangible evidence, uh, we need to prepare for that. That's part of the pre-validation planning um, uh, documentation, not only on, on that pre-validation planning and setting a good validation plan, but then also on that um, bioinformatics re uh, report or, or that data report at the very end uh, when we go through all the bioinformatics analysis. On pre-validation planning, um, laboratories must consider whether they have the right controls in place. Um, different assays, different targets um, can require different uh, uh, controls. So uh, some questions to, to ask uh, yourselves as, as uh, uh, laboratory managers, laboratory directors, uh, do I have protocols in place to efficiently execute the validation, right? That's come part of that pre-planning. Um, what I said as criteria and bounds are, are analytically appropriate to have a good, robust, tangible evidence and a good report um, for this uh, validation. So all of this should be uh, part of that planning, uh, should be completed before starting any uh, testing. We don't want to um, start tests and then find out that we don't have a good representative set of data, or we don't have the right controls, so we are not getting uh, what we expect out of the um, the data on these results. Um, so uh, again, very critical that pre-planning aspect of it. Um, that analysis, um, next generation sequencing in particular, creates very large data sets. Um, so uh, can vary depending on the assay being uh, validated. Um, many laboratories may not have the right bioinformatics resources, right? So um, it is important to make that assessment uh, and be very objective internally. Um, if we have um, the right resources for that. Um, also, we have the time. Again, there are large sets of data. Um, it will take some time to analyze, review, compile, summarize um, all these um, analytical data. And also the experience. Um, do we have the experience of um, analyzing this type of data? Um, so when these elements are considered, evaluated, confirmed up front, um, that leads to a successful validation, uh, partner within, uh, with an experienced team, um, experts on the um, ION platform, part of what um, the thermal scientific team offers, um, can be the difference between a quick successful engagement or a month long uh, frustrating experience. So let's uh, kind of look at, once again, breaking down um, what it takes to have the analytical validation. Now we're looking at um, the resources that we identify, right? So we are addressing that pre-planning, we're pre addressing that data analysis, um, the bioinformatics report. So uh, there are three uh, resources, tasks uh, that, that we feel are, are critical uh, for, again, that successful engagement. Um, so. When we look at these uh, critical elements in a validation, we can identify people, right, that can do this. Um, and an, an experienced project manager will help in identifying the right controls to use, um, ensure the controls are properly characterized, that we have, that we're uh, addressing the right targets uh, for this, that we have um, a proper validation plan um, in place, um, that we are preparing towards a um, solid and robust um, report. Now, on the bioinformatics piece, um, again, can be daunting, um, particularly for, for an experienced uh, people on a particular assay. But uh, in reality, uh, when we are, in most cases, validating an assay is because it is a new offering within that, that laboratory. So again, uh, that assessment, um, very honest assessment of having that experience um, is critical. So. Once we have all of this, there is one last piece that uh, we feel is, is, is critical, um, which is the, um, the application itself, right? So um, having the expertise um, and the experience to run um, this assay, uh, having the proper training um, on the platform, that is very critical. So 
from the manufacturer side, um, the application scientist uh, plays a very important role. Um, commonly, laboratories um, will need uh, to have support from that uh, trained application experts. Um, they, these experts ensure um, the staff is comfortable with the implementation of the assay, uh, with running the assay and the, and the equipment. So during the analytical validation testing, um, there could be questions. There could be situations where um, the, the laboratory staff needs to reach out and get support from um, the manufacturer. So being and having priority access um, to these uh, resources and, and really making sure that you can count on them um, is essential to keep everything on track and um, potentially avoid weeks delay. So now we're looking at uh, what we um, can offer from, from a Thermal Fisher uh, professional services uh, perspective. Um, we looked at the regulations, we look at the um, international quality standards, uh, we look at the experience from um, customers and, and even within our team, uh, our professional services team that has um, experience with this, uh, we look at how we can build a, a value proposition. And in this case, um, we feel that time, cost, and compliance, um, those are the three main areas um, that will make an impact for, uh, for laboratories. From a time perspective, having um, a project manager that really keeps the focus on the, on the validation, um, that is not subject to those competing priorities within uh, the day-to-day -day management of a, of a laboratory um, is, is critical. Um, it can be costly um, in terms of time when, when we don't have that, um, but then also when we look at sourcing the controls, right? That was another area that we uh, look at um, being able to properly address that, to have the proper controls, the proper set of samples. Um, uh, it, it reduces those costs, right? And, and keep control on that aspect that can quickly escalate. And finally, understanding uh, the validation strategy that fits between um, the quality requirements is critical. So as we saw before, there are a number of similarities. Um, but really targeting that particular compliance, um, it, it is essential. So our team has many years of collective um, experience in analytical validation, including bioinformatics and project management. So this allows us to quickly deploy and run through analytical validation. Um, inventory of uh, controls, uh, knowing up front since we know the, the assays and the panels, uh, what controls, work best for that particular um, assay and panel um, that again helps with keeping everything on track and, and limiting the uh, excessive cost um, and once again the efficiency of having that project management um, guidance um, really keeps everything on track so with a variable and evolving compliance environment um, having this overall support um, that's really critical in, in being successful in a um, and legal validation. Thermo Fisher, um, a large organization, we have many different uh, functional areas, uh, but within this team of professional services, um, we, we want to integrate everything, right? And, and we work with the rest of the um, organization. One thing that is critical, and, and this is why we have uh, four pillars that guide our service, um, one of them is, is transparency. Um, everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis here is uh, communication with the customer. So every time we engage on an article validation service, um, we're communicating with the customer, making recommendations, um, listening to their questions, and, and finding those answers for them. And that's where our integrated support um, comes um, into play, um, is to have access to the application sciences, is to have access to um, service engineers um, and, and, and have all that experience um, be able to optimize uh, the workflow for the customer, having access also to the development teams. Um, again, all of that comes together to really um, optimizing that workflow and giving the, the best um, uh, uh, overall perspective towards um, that analytical validation. Um, in terms of Flexibility, it, it's something that we have to do, right? Understanding their variations, um, um, even within the uh, European Union and the IBDR, 
once the um, modified bodies uh, are in place and, and they are also um, given directions more, more locally, uh, we can see differences. So we have to be sensitive uh, to each particular country, even within the IVDR um, larger regulation, uh, we need to be flexible and, and understand those differences. Um, and ultimately, technical acumen. Um, uh, we have constant training. Um, our teams are, 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 are experts on what they do, right? So um, we definitely uh, want to leverage that uh, collective experience uh, to be able to service our customers the best we can. So this is a little bit of, of, of a perspective of um, uh, what happens in a laboratory, right? Uh, when we are talking about um, adding a new uh, clinical test within a uh, laboratory's menu, um, that has a goal of ultimately being able to go into routine service, into routine testing. So the faster we do that, the faster um, the laboratory really sees a return on, on that initial investment of purchasing new equipment or potentially even a new platform uh, for that laboratory, purchasing that new assay. So we want to accelerate that process to really be able to allow the laboratory to fulfill um, their mission and see the return on, on that initial um, investment. So um, shortening that uh, analytical validation timeframe, it is uh, one critical aspect that we can bring in to um, support a larger uh, goal from clinical laboratories. What's included with the um, analytical validation service? Um, we have extensively talked about uh, the uh, project management part of this. Um, so dedicated project management is part of the service um, uh, application um, scientist support uh, from a clinical perspective, clinical application scientists. Uh, those are uh, part of the, um, the team uh, that delivers the analytical validation. So, they will make sure that um, uh, the workflow, the, uh, the, the staff, laboratory staff is uh, properly trained and comfortable, again, with um, implementing the, the assays. Um, and then ultimately that technical review of um, all the data that is being collected, right? So we discussed that includes the validation plan. That's one of the actual deliverables we provide as a, as a template for um, the laboratory. We have consultations on what's included on that template um, and what that means for, for the laboratory. Going through um, the report in the same manner, once we have all the data, the analysis that is done uh, with the data, then we have a consultation of what is being um, identified and what's being, uh, what comes out out of those um, uh, validation test runs, right? Um, so all of that is, is a, uh, happens on a, a consecutive basis with the customer every uh, week or so there is a call with the um, laboratory staff uh, to make sure we have that constant communication so we have developed again looking at flexibility and 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 what um, different laboratories uh, different needs can they can have um, different levels of service um, but ultimately as consulting service we can adapt any of this, um, but as a general guidance, right? So um, some laboratories, they, they may just want to have um, a, a pre-validation um, assessment and see how they are doing um, and before engaging in a uh, formal um, analytical validation. So for that, we have a performance verification service. Um, that service also have, uh, serves, as we discussed, uh, for validated uh, or commercially available um, assays, um, we can do a performance verification as well and, and walk the customer through that process. Um, the analytical validation regional, now it's a larger scale, now it's a, a complete um, validation. We are targeting under the ISO 15189 as everything we discussed uh, very early on in this uh, conversation um, with a dedicated project manager, uh, supplying uh, the controls, uh, documentation templates, um, several weeks engagement, depending on um, particular assay that it's being worked on. Um, but it goes through all that process as um, we defined before of uh, pre-planning, um, selecting the, uh, the right controls and samples, um, designing the appropriate test runs uh, with representative data, 
towards uh, what we want to uh, demonstrate and collect that tangible evidence, that analysis, and then finally um, a, a report on that that we collectively uh, consult with the customer on uh, put it together in a um, uh, in a report. Ultimately, we have um, a analytical validation service um, that is more specific. If some customers want to um, still uh, need more specific requirements, such as um, uh, CAPLIA, um, CLSSI, um, uh, or New York State Department of Health. So even outside the US, we sometimes find those uh, requests. Uh, we have a service that's specific um, for, that, uh, for that need. So there are a number of different assets and panels um, that uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific offers. Uh, we have successfully have um, engagements on uh, supporting customers and consulting with customers on um, uh, performing analytical validations on this, um, but we, we can work on custom panels, right? So this is not a, um, an exclusive um, list. Um, it's really just showing uh, the different um, assets and panels that we have worked with um, and consult with customers. Um, but ultimately, um, as I mentioned, we can do any um, custom panel as well. Uh, ultimately, it's the laboratory that decides what they want to include in their um, clinical menu. So just as a, as a recap, um, our uh, value proposition, where we have uh, really spent a lot of time and effort into uh, looking at the regulations, um, the standards that apply on a regional basis, um, and then uh, what that we, what we can put together that translates into um, accelerating that process of uh, onboarding a um, new assay or panel into your um, clinical menu. We have some um, references here that are pretty sure will be very valuable as, as you um, really engage into this process and look at uh, what you need to do within your um, organization. Uh, to set up um, um, this type of um, assays and, and bring them in and, and complete analytical validation. And uh, we deeply uh, thank you for this opportunity and uh, to have this um, conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Raphael, for sharing those experiences and insights into the AV journey, as well as the need for analytical validation. This concludes our presentation for today. Uh, please be sure and check back regularly for new webinar series or to view any of the presentations from today or the previously broadcasted webinars on demand here in the auditorium. Thanks again to Raphael and everyone who participated in this presentation. We hope you enjoyed today's event and look forward to seeing you again soon.